I must have only been 10 or 11 when I first played Final Fantasy X on the PS2. Up until that point, my main exposure to the Final Fantasy series had been FF7, which, like many young gamers in the late 90s, I absolutely adored. Although I loved playing games back then, same as most kids, FF7 was the first game which evoked a genuinely powerful emotional reaction in me. Prior to that, I wasn't even aware that a game could do that. The possibility just never really occurred to me. But the world, the characters, the music, everything, it all drew me in and perhaps even changed me as a person to some degree, bearing in mind that I was still just a kid. Although there are god knows how many titles and spin-offs in the Final Fantasy franchise at this point, only a handful ever really grabbed me. I appreciated and somewhat enjoyed the earlier titles, especially FF5, but they never quite did it for me in the way that FF7 did. Similarly, I was never particularly taken with FF8 as a kid, and upon replaying it in more recent years, found that game to be a bit of a mess. As for Final Fantasy IX, needless to say, it's an incredible and memorable game, and indeed a large percentage of the Final Fantasy fanbase consider it to be their favourite in the series. Regardless, however, I was never quite able to connect with it in the way so many others did. And I guess that brings me to Final Fantasy X. Very rarely did I get any brand new games as a kid, with most of my collection being second-hand titles picked up at the weekly car boot sale that my parents did. And so, although I owned the PS2, I had to wait a good year or two until after FF10 had been released before I actually got to play it. But the day did indeed come where I finally saw someone with Final Fantasy X for sale and I bought it. And upon returning home that day, I ran up to my room, put the disc in the tray, picked up the controller and started up the game. And do you know what? I hated it. Just joking, I literally think it's one of the best games ever made. There were big expectations for FF10 prior to its release. It was the first game in the series to be released for the PS2, the next generation and also the first to feature fully voice acted dialogue. The time period around that transition from PS1 to PS2 was a very exciting one, not least of all because of the significant graphical leap that the new hardware allowed. And make no mistake, 2001 and 2002 were insane years for gaming. The concentration of absolute classics released during that period really was something, and FF10 itself can absolutely be considered one of those classics. Full disclosure up front, there will be spoilers for the game throughout the video, as it's over 20 years old now. If you haven't played it yet and are wondering whether it's worth bothering with, yes, the answer's yes. I'm going to go through how FF10 sets up its story first. I won't get too deep into the weeds of the plot just yet, but I'd like to talk about how it starts off before delving into the game's mechanics and then circling back around to really dig into the story beats. I consider the opening cutscene of this game to be one of the most memorable in all of gaming, not least of all because of the accompaniment of the beautiful, sombre, musical masterpiece that is Tuzanarkand. We're shown a colourful cast of characters huddled round the fire within the ruins of an ancient city, strange lights glowing and flowing through the air. This cutscene establishes a very emotional tone which the game more than lives up to. Although FF10 is notorious for some painfully cheesy moments, don't get it twisted, there are a lot of heavy, mature themes explored too. Don't get me wrong though, the game is neither cynical nor depressive. On the contrary, it's happy and hopeful. Sprinkle them with the occasional emotional gut punch. After that first cutscene, the actual game starts off in a different location entirely. Or does it? We play as Tidus, star player of the Xanarkand Abes. By the way, I know it's supposed to be pronounced Tidus, but I'm not gonna, because I think it sounds dumb. It sounds too much like Tinus. The game makes it abundantly clear that Tidus is a big shot, being swarmed by adoring fans whilst on his way to the big game. This city, Xanarkand, is also presented in a way that really emphasises its scale. Of course, we don't really get to explore it in any meaningful way, but it's clear that this is a massive, advanced city, and it looks like a lot of fun. Upon reaching the stadium, the Blitzball game kicks off with the first of many stunning FMV sequences. I'll mention Blitzball again later on, but for now, suffice to say that it's a very important sport in this game's world. 
The game, however, is interrupted by a massive aquatic calamity, causing chaos, injury and death throughout the stadium and the city. Tidus encounters a familiar face outside the stadium, a man from his childhood known as Orin. He entreats us to follow, and we do, getting a better look at the source of destruction floating above the city, obscured by a massive sphere of water. We called it sin. Sin? Tidus is given a sword by Orin, a gift from his father, and the game throws us into a series of battles, very simple ones to demonstrate the basic battle mechanics. After fighting through hordes of enemies, Tidus finds himself hanging from a ledge after an explosion and along with huge sections of the crumbling city, he is sucked into a hole in the sky and spat back out in the ruins of a cold, crumbling temple in the middle of God knows where. After entering the temple, being nearly killed by a huge underwater beast on the way, Titus is attacked again but is saved by several strangely garbed figures armed with weapons. After the fight however, rather than receiving a warm greeting by these folk, they're knocked out and taken onto a ship. Here, Titus talks with the one friendly face aboard the ship, Riku, an important character who will become a full party member later on in the game. They're tasked with diving deep down into some ancient ruins in order to delicately retrieve some important technology. Which we succeed in doing after several more battles. Back aboard the ship, Titus finally has a chance to try to get some answers regarding where the hell he's ended up and who these people are. But what Riku tells him is that his home city, Xanarkand, was destroyed by Sin 1000 years ago, reduced to ruins, now apparently some holy place. There are no people there anymore, no massive buildings or packed blitzball stadiums, it's all gone. Riku promises to help Tidus out, but next thing we know, Sin appears again, attacking the ship and sending him overboard. Tidus wakes up on a sunny beach, having again been transported to a different location, but at least this time, he wasn't transported through time. After being introduced to some friendly blitzball players practicing on the shore, Tidus is given a welcome and invited down to Besaid village. One of the practicing players here is Wacker, captain of the Besaid Oryx blitzball team, and now fellow party member. A mention of Xanarkind draws some short, slightly hostile reactions however, and Titus feigns confusion, citing Sin's toxins as having muddled up his mind. Remember when Riku told us that the ruins of Xanarkand are now considered a holy place? This is the position of Yevin, the prevailing religion of the world. This world is now known as Spira. Titus and Waka make their way to Besaid village, a modest settlement with some small huts, but a large religious temple. Religion, specifically the teachings of Yevin, are extremely important to the people of Spira, and something taken very seriously and accepted without question by almost all groups and races. At the village, Tidus encounters another main character and party member, a black mage named Lulu. She's great. The third and most important character and party member we encounter at Besaid, however, is Yuna. She's a summoner and Waka and Lulu are her guardians. Summoners are some of the most important and revered people in all of Spira, as it's believed that they are the only ones who have the capability of defeating Sin. Sin is an entity which is considered eternal. While summoners are the only ones who can defeat it, it always comes back. The period of time after Sin has been killed is known as the Calm, and summoners who have succeeded in bringing about the Calm are known as High Summoners. The duration of previous calms throughout history is inconsistent, but one thing that is consistent is that sin always returns, causing indiscriminate death and destructions to villages, towns and cities throughout Spira. Yuna's father, High Summoner Braska, is one such summoner who defeated sin 10 years ago, and so Yuna has decided to follow in her father's footsteps, preparing to embark on a pilgrimage to every temple of Yevin all throughout Spira and eventually to the holy land of Xanarkand. Although he's a stranger in this strange land 1000 years into the future, Yuna feels an instant connection with Tidus, so he is also invited along for this most important of journeys. 
So that's essentially the beginning portion of FF10 and the setup for the rest of the story. It's an excellent introduction to the land of Spira, and both Tidus and we as players learn more and more about the culture, people and history of Spira as we journey from temple to temple. Something to point out about FF10, and a thing that is true of most RPGs, is that this is a very cutscene heavy game. Dialogue and story moments are happening all the time, while the actual gameplay is mostly reserved for battles and exploration in settlements and field areas. By no means is this a walking simulator, but it's not a gameplay heavy game. It's slow paced, not in the sense that it takes a while to get good because I think it's high quality the entire way through, but I mean it's slow in the sense that it indulges in a lot of character interaction and atmosphere instead of fast demanding gameplay. There's about as much watching as there is doing. As far as the actual gameplay is concerned, while a significant portion of FF10's playtime is devoted to fighting battles, the rest involves movement and exploration out in settlements and field areas. Up until the end game, FF10 is actually very linear. Your characters travel from temple to temple, meeting a host of memorable and lovable side characters along the way of course. There's not really any backtracking. Once you're done with one area, you move on to the next, up until you get access to the airship near the end which allows you to travel to any and all previously explored areas. Explorable locations can be divided into two main categories. Settlements, where the people of Spira live, and the roads and paths in between these settlements, where almost all your battles are fought. The settlements of Spira vary in size, but they tend to be kept quite modest because of the constant threat posed by Sin. Indeed, we actually see Sin nearly wipe out the coastal village of Kelika fairly early on into the game. While FF10 is linear, its various villages and cities are truly enjoyable to explore. Talking to inhabitants, finding hidden items, and just taking in the incredible visuals and atmosphere. Each location has a distinct style and feel. You have small, humble locations like the Said and Kilika. There's also larger, more advanced cities like Luka and Bevel. Then there's the sections of the world in between or on the outskirts of settlements, such as Mehen High Road. Kilika Woods, or Beaconel Desert. These areas essentially function as FF10's dungeons, even though they aren't literally dungeons. Rather, they tend to be really sunny and nice looking, only crawling with vicious monsters. Though again, quite linear, there are sometimes diverging paths to be taken in these areas, leading to optional bosses, treasure, or shortcuts. The two largest, most open such field areas are the Calm Lands and Beaconel Desert, whereas locations like Mushroom Rock Road, and Josie High Road just require you to move forward essentially. Although the game presents itself as being very large and grand, the actual world really isn't that big. Spatially, most of Spira is actually quite disconnected, with some locations only be accessible by ship or by air. Nonetheless, if you were to actually run across the entire map somehow, it wouldn't take long at all. The actual length comes from all the dialogue and cutscenes the loading times that occur in between each area, and the battles. I don't really say this as a negative, it's just the way FF10 ends up being such a long game. It just kind of tricks you with its presentation into thinking the world's huge, when it really isn't. But as a result, the areas that are here are high quality and memorable. In fact, some of the locations here are the most memorable in all of gaming, at least as far as I'm concerned. Even though it's super small, I just love wandering around Besaid Village and talking to the people there. Every aspect of its design feels so lovingly put together. This is just one example too, nearly every area in FF10 is a joy to travel through, and I truly consider some of these areas to be just flat out beautiful, with the beauty and atmosphere being enhanced beyond measure by what I consider to be the greatest video game soundtrack of all time, ever. Combat in FF10 is fully turn-based. In fact, not only is it turn-based, but you can actually see the whole battle's turn order. Battles also occur randomly whilst out in field areas. I know random battles are something which have heavily fallen out of fashion in the RPG space over the past decades, but I love them in FF10. They always look fantastic, with changing backgrounds depending on which area the player is currently in, and dynamic camera angles depending on which enemies are being fought and whether or not the next player attack is a kill shot. Your party members will also sometimes have unique comments upon entering certain battles under particular conditions, 
all of which really aids in keeping battles feel fresh and fun even after you've done literally thousands of them. What the battles lack in actual gameplay and control, they make up for in style. Excluding the MMO entry that was FF11, the next mainline single player entry in the Final Fantasy series after FF10 was FF12, another all time favourite of mine, though not quite as much as 10. FF12 however ditched the random encounters and made it so all enemies visibly roam around in field areas, giving the player the choice of whether or not to engage them, as well as allowing movement around the battle area in the midst of combat. As great as all this was, and as much as the combat did involve in FF12, I think 10's combat is much more stylish and cinematic, even though player involvement is pretty much restricted to what move do you want to use, and who do you want to use it on, compared to FF12 where battles are far more dynamic, where nearby enemies or NPCs can join into fights, or where the player can simply run away from encounters instead of selecting an option on the battle screen. The name of the game in FF10's battles is Strategy. Being fully turn based, you can take all the time in the world between actions and you'll know exactly who's going to take their turn after you at all times. Don't get me wrong, most of the encounters will be over pretty quickly. FF10 is not a hardcore RPG, unless they're taking the optional endgame content into account. A lot of your regular enemy battles will be over in just a few turns, and it's usually pretty obvious what you have to do to beat any particular enemy. More difficult bosses will require a strategy however. I mean you can't just grind to hell and steamroll enemies with raw stats, and this can be fun and all, but it's not the best way to play. It's amazing just how much you can do in FF10 with super low stats and self imposed restrictions. Just take a look at all the challenge runs for this game on YouTube. There are so many and people get through the whole game with just starting gear and starting stats purely through well thought out strategies. Learning enemy attack patterns, taking advantages of elemental weaknesses and making smart use of items, and utilising myriad more factors which can be learnt and used against the game's many enemies. In total, FF10 boasts 7 different party members, all with their own core roles in battle. Tidus is fast, with decent accuracy and strength, and is best at handling wolf or lizard type enemies. Waka is the most accurate of all party members, and is the optimal choice when striking small flying enemies with high evasion. Don't strain yourself, I'll handle the bird. And he also has access to many status afflicting skills. Lulu is the black mage and so has access to powerful magics, but is terrible strength as well as an absurdly long attack animation. Yes, it's cute the first few times you see it, but it's way too fucking long, come on. It's literally enough to always make me ditch using her in the end game. Flans and elementals with super high physical defence, but elemental weaknesses are best handled by Lulu's magic. Yuna is the party's white mage and is excellent at healing, curing and reviving, but like Lulu, she shouldn't really be used for attacking due to her low strength. As well as her white mage abilities, Yuna is also unique in that she's the only party member with the summon ability, something which holds huge importance for both the gameplay and story. There's also Riku, who is super fast but has poor strength and very low HP. She's the most vulnerable party member. She can, however, use the steal and use abilities. Stealing is super important in this game because many enemies have really powerful and useful items to be stolen. Furthermore, the first time the player uses steel on a particular enemy it has a 100% success rate. Steel can even be used many times on the same enemy, although the chance of it succeeding decreases after every successful attempt. The use ability goes hand in hand with steel because it allows for the utilisation of stolen items. While conventional items such as potions and phoenix downs can be used by anyone via the item command, certain special items can only be used via use. Kinda confusing I know, but there's a ton of really cool interesting items which can do anything from doubling a character's max HP for the battle, to turning every enemy to stone. So whilst Riku can be easily killed, she can also be the most powerful member in your party depending on what items you have and how you use them. Next, we have Orin. Of course, Tidus encountered Orin back at the very start of the game in Xanarkand, but we meet him again a bit later when he joins the party. Orin's strong as fuck and has the highest strength out of anyone, as well as very high HP and very high defence. His weapons also tend to do piercing damage, allowing him to deal with tougher enemies with hard exteriors that Tidus or Waka might struggle with. 
He does, however, have poor accuracy, and so nimbler beasts are best left to the other guys. And last but not least, there's the halberd wielding Kamari, who also joins the party in Besaid, although he kinda acts like a psycho and tries to kill Titus for some reason. Kamari is the outlier of the group, because he doesn't really have a specific role the way the others do. Rather, he can be powered up in the fashion of any of the other characters. While the others have their own optional, but preferred paths on the sphere grid, which I'll talk more about shortly, Kamari doesn't, and instead he can go whichever way the player wants. You can have him learn black magic like Lulu, or you can have him go down Orin's path, be another high physical damage dealer. The one thing he can do that no one else can, however, is learn abilities from enemies via his Lancet ability. There are a bunch of different enemy abilities to learn throughout the game, and while some are piss poor, others are very powerful, like Mighty Guard or Stone Breath. Now, although these are the intended roles for each party member, you really don't have to adhere to them, especially when it comes to the end game. Although following these intended progression paths leads to satisfying and effective combat, where each character has their own distinct strengths and weaknesses in battle, you actually are free to develop your characters in nearly any way. In FF10, party members don't level up as such. Rather, members who defeat enemies in battles are rewarded with AP, and when they gain enough AP, they'll gain a sphere level. Instead of your characters having a level between 1 and 99, where stat increases are tied to how high their level is, as is traditionally done, stat increases are instead managed on the sphere grid. This is also where abilities are learned, including a massive variety of specials, skills, black magic and white magic. Although the sphere grid looks very intimidating at first glance, it's actually really easy to understand. The sphere grid is comprised of hundreds and hundreds of nodes. Some of these are empty, while others correspond to an ability, though most are for stat increases between 1 and 4 for one of the game's 8 attributes. Each character starts on a particular node on the sphere grid and can move from one node to nearly any adjacent node, requiring one sphere grid point each for every single movement. Once a character moves to a node corresponding to a particular stat increase, it can be activated using the relevant sphere type. For example, this node increases strength by 4 and requires a power sphere to activate, while this one increases accuracy by 4, requiring a speed sphere. These various sphere items are a reward for winning battles and are really easy to obtain. As well as stat increases, all abilities are learned on the sphere grid too, requiring ability spheres to activate. Although each character uses the same sphere grid layout, a single node can be activated by any number of characters, so in theory, you can have every party member activate every node of the whole sphere grid, although this would take a while. Furthermore, although for most of the game, the empty nodes serve purely as things to make you have to spend additional points before reaching an actual stat upgrade node, later on in the game, you can actually convert these into stat upgrade nodes using particular spheres. So, for example, you can use a strength sphere to turn an empty node into a strength node and then use a power sphere to activate the strength node leading to a plus 4 for your character's strength attribute. Simple, right? I've played a bunch of Final Fantasy games in my day, and the sphere grid is without a doubt my favourite system out of them all. It looks great, has depth, is massive, and it's a lot of fun to use. It offers a ton of freedom regarding how you want to upgrade your party members. For example, although the game intends for Orin to be your most formidable physical damage dealer with his intended sphere grid path mainly revolving around HP, defence and strength, you can ignore this if you like and instead have him go down a totally different path and maybe be your go-to black mage. By that same token, you're free to upgrade Lulu so that she becomes a physical powerhouse, destroying massive behemoths with a flip kick from her character. Although this freedom is great, it can also lead to all your characters feeling pretty much the same. This is unlikely to be much of an issue at all throughout the game's story, because by the end of it, you're likely only to have completed just a fraction of the sphere grid for any one particular party member. But when it comes to the end game, we are aiming for party optimization, grinding stats for some of FF10's many, many super bosses. You'll likely find that having different characters specialise in particular roles becomes unnecessary. 
why bother having Wu Wu be your designated black mage when you can just have everyone be great at magic? Why have Riku be your high agility thief when you can just give everyone high agility and teach them all the steel ability? There's no reason not to. In the late game it's really easy to grind for sphere brood points and gain a ton of stat increases for everyone, and so you'll find that there's really not any disadvantage to having everyone be great at everything. Essentially you can have it so the only functional difference between your characters is their appearance and their unique overdrive abilities, and I guess Yuna is an outlier too, as she's the only person on your squad who can summon. Bear in mind though that your party members feeling too similar is only really a thing that crops up if you're going for the endgame content. FF10 is a lengthy game, even only taking the main story content into account, but there's also a massive amount of optional endgame side quests, super bosses and special equipment to get into. Like any Final Fantasy game, you can also change up and improve your gear. FF10 keeps it somewhat simple here too, as each character has just two types of equipment to worry about, weapons and armour. The way equipment works is quite interesting that it differs from most other Final Fantasy games, but a sword you get in the end game will usually be way better than one you get at the start. Yeah sure everyone loves Cloud's Buster Sword from FF7, but it's also shit and you ditch it as soon as you can, because it starts are rubbish, there's no reason to use it past the beginning of the game. In FF10 however, the only effects that equipment has on a character depends on its passive abilities. Some weapons have literally no abilities whereas others can have as many as 4 slots. Some passives are really weak and uninteresting, maybe only giving a character plus 5% defence, whereas others like Magic Booster imbue plus 50% damage to any magic attack. And then there's Break Damage Limit, enabling a character to break the 9999 damage limit, instead allowing them to do as much as 99999, permitting that the strength is high enough. And so, rather than weapons just giving flat stat increases, it's all about the passive abilities tied to them. The exact same applies to armour too, which has its own extensive list of possible passives. Towards the late game, you might also want to start thinking about customising your equipment, which can be done as long as you've got the right items and lots of them. The chances of finding the perfect piece of equipment out in the field is pretty slim, and so if you want to stand a chance against some of FF10's hardest enemies, you're going to want to customise the perfect piece of armour to have abilities like Auto Phoenix, Ribbon and Auto Haste. Customisation is actually less important for weapons though, because every character in FF10 has their own unique ultimate weapon, known as Celestial Weapons in this game. They're not particularly straightforward to obtain though. Before these weapons even show up at all, you've got to find a special hidden item called the Cloudy Mirror. Then do a short side quest in Makalantia Woods to gain access to a special crystal which will convert the Cloudy Mirror into the Celestial Mirror. This in turn allows you to find and open special chests hidden all around Spira containing Celestial Weapons. Some are more straightforward to find than others, but they're too good not to bother with. Except the weapons are actually shit, at first anyway. You see, to unlock their full potential, an extra item is needed, called the Crest. Each character has their own crest, corresponding to a particular celestial body. Orin has the Mars crest, Tidus has the Sun crest, and so on and so forth. Crests are also hidden all around Spira, but are great fun to find and super rewarding when you return back to that crystal in Makalan Woods and activate your celestial weapon's true potential. But not really because they're still borderline useless after this. Each character's celestial weapon also has a second special item required to activate it fully, called a sigil. These tend to be much harder and more time consuming to get a hold of compared to crests. Getting the Venus sigil for Lulu is notoriously horrific to get, requiring you to dodge 200 lightning strikes in a row in the Thunder Plains area. It's exactly as difficult and as unpleasant as it sounds. Getting the Sun sigil for Tidus is also super difficult because you need to do all these stupid fucking chocobo minigames and literally get a time of 0, 0.00. The most time consuming one of all is Waka's Jupiter Sigil, requiring you to spend hour after hour playing games of Blitzball. Seriously, it takes fucking ages. But once you have both the Crest and Sigil for a particular celestial weapon and go through with the activation ritual, you're left with the best weapons in the game. They all have extremely powerful abilities and are pretty much a requirement for taking on the hardest enemies. It's actually possible to customise your own weapons so that they have pretty much the same abilities as the celestial weapons, 
but the amount of time it would take to grind for all the items required makes it not worth it at all. Plus, it's really rewarding after you've gone through all the work to activate these really cool looking legendary weapons. And now that we've talked about the different character celestial weapons, we should talk about overdrives. Overdrives are basically FF10's version of limit breaks. As a party member takes more and more damage, their overdrive gauge will steadily increase, though as you progress through the game, fighting more and more battles, you'll unlock other overdrive modes, such as Warrior, which allows you to increase your gauge by dealing damage, or Victor, which instead increases the gauge every time you win a battle. Different overdrive modes can be set for different characters too, and so it's best to mix and match overdrive modes based on the roles that different characters play. As you'd expect, overdrives are some of the highest damage dealing moves in the game, and are pretty much vital when taking on the game's hardest enemies. Each party member's overdrive abilities are very thematic to the characters too. For example, Waka blasts enemies with his blitz ball, while Lulu's fury overdrive allows you to obliterate monsters with chains of black magic. Also, overdrives tend to require some button input minigame just prior to execution, which can increase its effectiveness. These button inputs will get a little bit trickier too as you unlock some of the more powerful later game overdrives. Furthermore, even the methods required to unlock stronger overdrive abilities differ from character to character. Tidus's overdrives are the most straightforward to unlock, with the next one becoming available for use after the previous one has been used 10 times, and then 30 times, and then finally 80 times to unlock the awesome Blitz Ace. That takes a while by the way. In comparison, you can unlock more overdrives for Orin by finding more and more hidden video spheres hidden throughout Spira. Waka has the longest and most problematic method of unlocking more overdrives, because if you want to unlock his attack reels, status reels and finally oryx reels, again you've got to play Blitzball. Now don't get me wrong, Blitzball is a really fun and surprisingly in-depth minigame, and many people actually just unlock stuff for Waka through playing Blitzball for fun, but that enjoyment can really wear off when you have to play game after bloody game of it to unlock his overdrives, not to mention his aforementioned Jupiter sigil. It's optional to do all this of course, but Waka just so happens to have the most OP overdrive in the entire game, his attack reels. You can literally do just under 1.2 million damage with this attack. But although these high damage overdrives are a lot of fun to pull off and inflict massive damage on enemies and bosses, by far the most interesting overdrive in the game belongs to Riku, because she can mix. The mix overdrive is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. It allows her to mix any two items in your inventory to create a far more powerful item. The potency of the mixture depends on what two items you've mixed and how powerful they themselves are. For example, mixing a grenade with a fish scale will result in a weaker final item compared to if you were to mix a dark matter and a shining gem. Riku can make all sorts of fun and weird items with her overdrive and it never gets old trying out different combinations, but I'd say it also makes her the most important endgame character. Although the outlandish explosives and elemental hazards she can throw at enemies are great, it's the unique buffs she has access to that are a massive help when taking on the game's super bosses. I'm thinking mixtures such as Ultra Null All and Hyper Mighty G. Overdrives were done really well in this game, and as I mentioned, they're one of the only things which actually make your party members feel truly distinctive from one another. You can massively raise up Tidus' stats so that he's an all round powerhouse, but he can never get access to the mix overdrive. Similarly, you can do a truckload of damage with Waka's attack reels, but that might not always be the right move when compared to the negative status effects inflicted by Orin's third overdrive, Banishing Blade. While we're on the subject of FF10's most powerful abilities, we've got to talk about Aeons. Aeons are powerful monsters which are called to aid in battle via Yuna's summon ability. An important driver of the story throughout the first half of the game is Yuna's pilgrimage throughout Spira, travelling from temple to temple with her guardians, where inside, after going through a series of trials, she prays to holy entities known as the Faith. When a summoner prays long and hard enough to the Faith, they are gifted with the power of an Aeon. A summoner must pray at every one of Spira's temples to receive the power of every Aeon before ending their journey at the world's edge, in Xanarkand, where they will receive the final Aeon, said to be the only thing 
powerful enough to defeat Sin, albeit temporarily. In total, there are eight different Aeons which Yuna can unlock throughout her journey, five mandatory ones and three which are optional. The mandatory ones get progressively more powerful too, and you'll probably find that once you gain access to a new one, you won't feel the need to use earlier ones so much. While summoning is present in most, if not all, the mainline Final Fantasy games, the ability usually functions as a single super powerful attack, requiring some MP and being accompanied by an awesome flashy cutscene. In FF10, however, you can actually control the summoned creature, while your actual party members temporarily leave the battle for as long as the Aeon is present. Most of the game's Aeons, bar two in particular, function quite conventionally. They have an attack, a special attack, and some magic, although you do get the option to have Aeons learn additional abilities later on in the game. Also, the same way your party members can use special overdrive abilities after they've taken or dealt enough damage, the same applies to Aeons. Both the intro cinematic and cutscenes for each Aeon are incredible. They look absolutely extravagant, hurling enemies into the air, incinerating them with powerful flares and obliterating them with powerful rays of energy. These sequences can go on for a while and while they are a joy to watch, they can drag a bit after you've seen them for the 50th time. Thankfully, the game does have an option to shorten these sequences. Among the selection of Aeons are a few series favourites too, like Ifrit, Shiva and the Mighty Bahamut, which means Hellfire, Diamond Dust and the classic Mega Flare. Mega Flare in particular is a special one here, because the initial damage limit in this game is actually 9999. Bahamut, however, can actually break this damage limit with his overdrive. It's pretty sick when you first use it, expecting it to do maybe 8000 damage, and you end up doing 15,000 or something, with a single attack. The optional Aeons are where the true power is at though, but they take more work to actually get. Yojimbo is the first optional Aeon you'll get access to, and he might be one of the coolest entities in all of gaming. I cannot watch his intro cinematic without grinning. It's so fucking sick. Mechanically, he's also very unique, because you can't actually give him commands in battle. Instead, you pay him an amount of gil of your choosing at the start of the battle, and then he basically does what he wants. Regardless of how much you pay him, he'll only ever do one of four attacks. Diagoro, Kazuka, Wakizashi, or his really special attack, Zanmato. Although getting him to actually perform Zanmato can sometimes be a bitch, it's literally the most powerful attack in the game. In fact, it's so powerful that I am of the opinion that it's best not used at all. I say this because it literally kills any enemy in one hit. Anything. Even the game's most powerful super bosses, dead in one hit, chopped in half. When I was a kid playing this, I beat a few of the hardest enemies using this attack, because I sucked. And although it looks really cool and all, it's hardly the most fulfilling way to play the game. Nonetheless, the option is there. Another optional Aeon is Anima, and she is my favourite in the whole game. It can also be kind of a bitch to actually get her though. See, I mentioned that before reaching the faith in the game's many religious temples, the player has to go through trials. Each temple has its own cloister of trials, and they're totally different at every location, tying into the theme of that particular temple. Jose Temple has a lightning theme and a lightning based Aeon, and so its cloister of trials revolves around lightning whereas Makalania Temple has an ice theme, being the home of the Aeon Shiva, so the cloister of trials there involves building an ice bridge. One similarity which all these trials share is the use of spheres, which must be placed in the correct pedestal or wall recess in order to open or activate the correct section of the area. There is a potential issue related to the cloister of trials for the temples at Besaid and Makalania, however. This is because in order to unlock the Aeon Anima, you have to complete an optional part of each cloister of trials at each temple, but because it's optional, you can totally miss it. Luckily, you can return to temples later on in the game to undertake the cloister of trials once more, 
as many times as you like. So I'll just make my way to Besaid now and we'll get that sorted. Okay, what about Makalani? I have to do that one too. So I'm just gonna. Oh. Fool! To come back to Makalani Temple, a traitor! Traitor! Find your salvation on the far plane! Yeah. You see, around the time you reach the end game and they get freedom to explore Spira, your airship, to tie up loose ends, finish side quests, and work at getting the secret Aeons, certain enemies show up at particular parts of the world, the Dark Aeons. These are some of the hardest enemies in the game. Their stats are massive and they require a lot of strategy and preparation before you have a chance of beating them. They're all totally optional, of course. But one of the many appeals of the end game is getting your characters all buff and kitted out with the best gear so you can have a chance against these titans. These super bosses have literally millions of HP each. Not all of them are too brutal to fight, Dark Veil 4 is by far the easiest, but some are a true challenge like Dark Bahamut. But back to the original topic, yeah the game sometimes screws you if you miss certain things the first time around, with access to anime being just one such example. This is because if you miss the optional bits of the Besaid and Makalania Cloister of Trials, you can't go back in and retry them because Dark Vilfor and Dark Shiva literally guard the entrances to these areas. Why is this an issue? Well, because the path to getting anima only opens up if you fully completed every Cloister of Trials at every temple. The final optional Aeon is the Magus Sisters, being hidden at a secret and totally optional temple. Like you Jimbo, the Magus sisters have unique mechanics. For a start, there's three of them, and you can't directly tell them which attacks or abilities to use. Rather, you can just give them suggestions and hope that they'll do what you want, or they can literally just sit around and do nothing. The Magus sisters are really fun to use and needless to say, are super powerful. Also, I think their overdrive delta attack has the longest sequence of any attack in the game. Sick. Although Final Fantasy X has many strong points, its visuals in particular stand out. Of course, almost everyone plays the superb looking HD remaster these days, but even back on the PS2, this was by far one of the best looking games of that generation, largely because of the unique art style. Now I'm not a particularly artistically inclined individual and won't pretend that I can speak about art or graphics with any level of true competency, but I will say this. Final Fantasy X's visual style is incredibly distinctive. The levels are all so colourful and the architecture of Spira is abundant with engravings, symbols and banners all adorned on these weird and wonderful buildings. The interiors of some of these buildings are absolutely jaw-dropping to look at. Absurdly bright and colourful, yet utterly stylish. For important story reasons, the world of Spira is mostly free of electricity and machines, with some exceptions. And so the people make do with an alternate form of technology, in the form of spheres. 
Spheres are basically orbs of energy from the remnants of the deceased who leave behind ghostly phenomena known as pyreflies when they pass on. Spheres and pyreflies appear everywhere in FF10 and add another layer of otherworldliness to the fantastical land of Spira. As is Final Fantasy tradition, the cast of characters also look very weird and wonderful. And even now, after being a massive fan of this game for well over 15 years, I still find myself noticing new things about some of their designs every now and then. Don't get me wrong, some of the characters and side casts look a little bit dumb sometimes. For example, I've never been a big fan of this haircut. But the character designs here are interesting, odd and certainly memorable. Of course, what would a Final Fantasy game be without cool enemies? FF10 has a ton of them, and most of them have at least a touch of weirdness about them. You'll find plenty of familiar Final Fantasy favourites such as wolves, imps, elementals, flans and marlboroughs, but there's way more cool stuff too. This game loves throwing massive, squishy enemies at you, like the Sandworm or the Barbados. The best designs are the bosses though. Again, a lot of big, crazy shit here. Bizarre machines with constantly moving parts, ancient worms, and other stuff where you can't even tell exactly what it even is. Also have to give a massive shout out to the animations. As fantastic and fun as these enemies' general designs are, their animations are top tier as well. Even as old as FF10 now is, the way enemies move is still a joy to watch, both their standing and attack animations. Stuff like the Adam and Toys' breath attack, or Seymour Flux's cross cleave, or just the zoo's flying animation. The shit looks really good, and to say it holds up would be an understatement. As truly and distinctly excellent as Final Fantasy X looks, however, where it shines even brighter is its soundtrack. It's hardly a controversial claim to say that Final Fantasy games tend to have absolutely outstanding OSTs. They're a huge part of what makes people love this franchise as much as they do, or used to, at least before the games start to suck. Like many, I've got an emotional attachment to many tracks from these games, but none more so than FF10. Its soundtrack is utterly transcendent, not to mention extremely varied. You've got the sunny acoustic Sight of Spira, and then the chilled out tones of the Sage theme. Then there's the sombre and ambient Wandering Flames, and the battle theme which I still somehow love even after hearing it literally thousands of times. In particular, the piano track which plays during the game's opening cutscene, Tizanarkind, is beyond the classic. Possibly the most interesting and creative tune in the whole game though is the Hymn of the Faith. You hear this song all over Spira, and it's actually a different variation that plays in each location, with different vocalists singing at different octaves, while other times the theme appears in the deep, stark style reminiscent of monks singing in a monastery, and yet at other times sung in the style of a beautiful church choir with fantastically shifting harmonies. It's a fairly simple theme, but they did so much with it, and it's one of the many examples of the joy, genius, and beauty of Final Fantasy X's soundtrack. So, now that I've covered the game's many elements and systems, I would like to return to the story. As enjoyable and deep as the battles are, as well as the equipment and stat systems which drive them, the thing that ties it all together is the incredible story. As previously mentioned, FF10 has a massive amount of cutscenes. When moving around in the world, your characters will very often stop for a dialogue cutscene, allowing for a significant amount of interaction between your characters and enabling the player to learn more and more about the ways of Spira. Something which is repeatedly hammered through as we travel from settlement to settlement and temple to temple is that Spira is a land suffering from constant fear and anxiety. This is entirely because of sin. Sin can appear anywhere at any time and there's little to nothing that most people can do to stop it. It is an unholy entity of gargantuan size and power and it exists simply to kill and destroy. As the player travels throughout Spira, as bright and happy as most of its locations are, and as upbeat and kind as most of its citizens may be, sin is never away from people's minds. 
It's a constant source of existential dread for this world. This is why summoners such as Yuna are so important to Spira's culture and sanity. Even though Sin always comes back after being beaten by a summoner, the period of calm in between, for however long it may last, is too precious not to pursue. A period of months or years where people can sleep easy without worrying about their own annihilation is all people really want in this land. Also, people still hold on to the desperate hope that maybe this time when a summoner defeats Sin, it might not come back. Furthermore, the one and only religion throughout Spira, Yevin, teaches that one day, once everyone in Spira achieves full atonement, only then will Sin be truly vanquished. As for how this atonement can be achieved, or when, Yevin has no answers. However, the people of this land are not taught to question these teachings, only to obey. Those who reject the teachings of Yevin are considered heathens by most of Spira, with their revilement being all the more intense due to the belief that they stand in the way of Spira's true atonement, and thus in the way of Sin's true defeat. One such race of people are known as the Albed. It was a group of Albed who rescued Titus near the start of the game from the ship. Our party member, Riku, is an Albed, and Yuna herself is in fact half Albed. You see, another reason why Yevin so reviles the Albed is because they use the forbidden Machina. Machina are essentially just machines, such as special weapons, vehicles and airships, which the Albed are experts at constructing and maintaining. The issue here is that Machina are said to be at the source of Spira's original sin. You see, 1000 years ago, before sin, there were far larger, more advanced civilizations in the world. Xanarkand itself is known for being a city of Machina, where machines were essentially built to do all the work while people chilled out and enjoyed themselves. However, Xanarkand went to war with the city of Bevel, and both cities kept on developing more and more powerful Machina to compete with the other, until they'd created weapons strong enough to destroy the entire world. Yevin teaches that because of this war, Sin was created, completely destroying the cities, and thus has this massive hellish monstrosity been a plague on the people of Spira ever since. This, Yevin teaches, is mankind's reward for letting things get out of hand. Yuna, Lulu and especially Waka are the most devout followers of Yevin from our group, expounding upon its teachings throughout the game. Titus, however, did not grow up having been indoctrinated into this religion, so things that most other people of this land accept as implicit truth, he questions. For example, why should any blame lay with the people of today for the sins of people from a millennia ago? Why should the responsibility of atonement fly with modern day man? Although she is an Albed, Riku hides her lineage from the group so as not to incur any untoward ire. However, her true identity does eventually get discovered, and boy is Waka mad! Those Sam Blastic Grease Monkeys! He's a bit of a lovable racist. Riku acts as another voice of reason from this point on, occasionally debating points of religion with Waka. As our party travels through the game, it's gradually revealed that Yevin is completely corrupt and rife with lies, bigotry and hypocrisy. Many of its teachings turn out to be there just to manipulate the population into obeying the words of its leaders, the Maesters. Maesters are essentially the highest ranking leaders in all of Spira, being even more revered than summoners. Their word is law, and you don't want to get on the wrong side of them. One such maester, having been newly appointed by the time we are introduced to him, is Maester Seymour. What an extravagant hairstyle. Although Sin is the ever-looming main threat throughout the game, as the game progresses, Seymour also develops into another main antagonist. Though he starts off essentially on our side, and we even get to play as him in one battle, it's eventually revealed that he in fact murdered his father, Maester Jiskill claiming his role as Maester. When confronted by this, the party is actually forced to fight and kill Seymour. However, death works differently at Spira. When someone dies or is killed, if their attachment to this world is strong enough, they can carry on living, being essentially indistinguishable to a regular person. This is something of a perversion of the natural order of things, however. So when deaths occur, a summoner is supposed to perform a ritual called the Sending. We see Yuna perform this ritual in Kilika after it's attacked by Sin, and its purpose is to send the souls of the dead to the afterlife, known as the Far Plane. If a soul is not sent to the Far Plane in a timely manner, it could become resentful of the living and turn into a fiend. 
Fiend is the term used for beasts and monsters in FF10, and it's strongly suggested that most of the enemies fought throughout the game were at one point regular people who weren't sent to the far plane after dying. Anyway, even after Seymour is killed, he carries on living as a horribly corrupt Maester of Yevon, leading to several more dramatic and challenging encounters with him, with each of his forms being more bizarre and monstrous than the last. Although I like Seymour as a villain, his motives are kind of cliché. It's yet another case of the land is filled with sorrow, and so in order to eliminate sorrow from the world, the best course of action must be to kill everyone, because then there would be no more pain. It's been done plenty of times before, and it's fine I guess. The way he wants to achieve his goal is where it gets interesting, because he himself wants to become Sin. Fairly shortly into the game, Orin reveals to Titus that Sin is in fact Jekt, Titus' father. When Titus was a child, Jekt went out to sea for training one day, but then simply never returned, being presumed to have died out at sea. Except that's not what happened. What actually happened was that Jekt was transported to the land of Spira the same way Titus was. There he encounters Orin and Yuna's father, High Summoner Braska. Through various video spheres found throughout Spira, we discover that Jekt embarked on a similar sort of journey to Titus, himself also being a stranger in this land, travelling to all the same locations that he has. Eventually, Braska and his guardians, Jekt and Orin, complete their pilgrimage and make it to Xanarkand, City of the Dead, in order to claim the final Aeon and defeat Sin. There, they encounter Unaleska, the first ever High Summoner who reveals that there's a morbid caveat to obtaining the final Aeon. Instead of praying to the faith, as is the case in every other temple, the summoner must choose one of his or her guardians to become the final Aeon, essentially becoming a sacrifice. With this power, the summoner can defeat Sin and is then killed by their own final Aeon. Although the process of obtaining the final Aeon is a secret throughout Spira, it's well known that the summoner is always killed after defeating Sin. In this sense, summoners essentially submit themselves as sacrifices in order to bring temporary peace to the people. They do so knowing that even if they succeed in their pilgrimage, they themselves will never get to enjoy the peace that they have worked so hard to bring about. This adds an extra layer of tragedy and emotion to the journey of Yuna and her guardians, because every time Yuna travels through a settlement or temple, she knows that it's the last time she'll ever see it. But back to the final Aeon, you see, once a final Aeon is used to defeat Sin, the final Aeon actually becomes Sin. This is what happened with Titus' father checked. Flashbacks reveal that Titus' relationship with his father was tumultuous, to say the least, and there's some proper daddy issues going on. So when he finds out that Sin is actually his own father, who he hasn't seen in a decade, he doesn't take it too well. But going back to Seymour, he wants to become Sin himself and destroy all of Spira, reducing it to a land of the dead where there exists only Sin. As for the final Aeon, Yuna and her guardians journey to Xanarkand and also meet Unaleska, except this time, for the first time in 1000 years, the summoner rejects the ritual. Yuna refuses to sacrifice any of her guardians, her friends, believing that there has to be a better way. Furthermore, Yuna actually confirms that sin is eternal. Despite what Yevon teaches, there can be no atonement. Tradition must be followed. Sin destroys. A summoner embarks on a pilgrimage to Zanarkand, where a guardian is sacrificed as the final Aeon. Sin is defeated using the final Aeon, who then in turn kills the summoner. Then the final Aeon becomes sin after a period of dormancy, whereupon the cycle will repeat for eternity. This is the spiral of death. This is Spira. Both Unileska and Yevon reject the possibility that there is any alternative way of defeating Sin, insisting that this morbid tradition is all there is to give the people of Spira hope, as false as it may be. Upon Yuna refusing to carry on this tradition, however, Unileska attacks her and her guardians, leading to a great three phase boss battle. Turns out she was actually a giant snake lady. Hmm, who'd have thought? With Unileska defeated, the only known method of defeating Sin is forever gone, and so an alternative way must be thought of. Through communication with the Faith, 
we discover that the true source of sin, and thus the true enemy, is an ancient powerful summoner known as Yu Yevin. The monster we know as sin, although controlled to some degree by the previously sacrificed final Aeon, is actually more akin to armour for the true entity within, Yu Yevin. Thus, unless Yu Yevin itself is defeated, Sin will simply be reborn. This is because Yu Yevin possesses the final Aeon used to defeat Sin each time it is defeated. At this point, Yu Yevin isn't necessarily even evil. As we see later on, it's more of a bizarre entity than a person with any sort of will. It now exists only to summon. It also draws upon the power of the faith to allow for the control of such a powerful creature as Sin. Here's where things get a bit more confusing. We discover that prior to the destruction of Xanarkand, the city's most powerful summoners sacrificed themselves, becoming Faith, so as to preserve Xanarkand in the form of a dream. Both Tidus and Jekt are actually entities born of this dream. The Xanarkand therefrom isn't actually the real one destroyed a millennium ago, it's the one from the dream of the Faith. The issue is, the Faith have been dreaming for a thousand years, and they're tired. They can't stop dreaming, however, because their powers are being used by Yu Yevin to maintain control of Sin, and so Yuna and her guardians must defeat Sin and Yu Yevin for real in order to allow the faith to rest, bringing about the eternal calm where Sin will never return, allowing Spira to finally know true peace. After an epic fight with Sin, our characters actually travel inside him in a cool Willy Wonka-esque sequence encountering and defeating the final form of Seymour, whose theme in this fight is underrated as fuck by the way. Eventually, after fighting powerful beasts and traversing through dead ruins, we encounter Tidus' father, Jekt, and of course things get emotional. This is followed by the penultimate final boss, Braska's final Aeon. After this, we encounter Yu Yevin, at this point frantically flying around the arena as a spirit, looking for a new Aeon to inhabit. The next part requires Yuna to summon all her Aeons, one at a time, for Yu Yevin to possess, for us to then defeat, until all our Aeons are gone and Yu Yevin has no more available Aeons, forcing it to fight us in its true form. Once all our Aeons have been beaten, Yu Yevin exposes itself in its true form. Yeah, it's kind of weird looking. It will hit you with some powerful magic, but again, you can't lose, so pummel away until Spira's true nightmare has been felt. Now that Yu Yevin has been defeated, Sin is truly dead, forever. But that also goes for every Aeon in the world. This is because Aeons are gifts awarded by the Faith, who have now been released, allowing them to finally rest after a thousand years. Unfortunately, because Tidus is also a dream of the Faith, brought to Spira to finally put an end to Sin, he begins to fade from existence, resulting in a beautiful but extremely sad goodbye to all his friends and Yuna, who have both came to love each other throughout their journey. This incredible story concludes with Yuna making a grand 
an optimistic speech to Spira in Locust Stadium. And that about sums up the story of FF10. It truly has one of the greatest stories of any video game, and in my view, certainly the best story of all Final Fantasy games. The cast of characters have such appealing personalities and designs, and by the end you truly feel an attachment towards each of them. They're so full of life, and the interactions and friendships between these characters throughout their journey are magically written. I'm not saying things don't get a bit too cheesy from time to time, but there were a bunch of moments that really got me during this playthrough, and the ending is especially sad, even though it's also happy and optimistic. I said it at the beginning, and I'll say it again, Final Fantasy X is one of the greatest games ever made, and probably the best RPG ever made. I don't think we'll ever get something quite like it again. It was too magical, and Square Enix sure as shit aren't up to the task these days. Of course, they did go and make a sequel, Final Fantasy X 2, the first time they'd done so for a mainline Final Fantasy game. FF 10 2 had a lot of good things about it, but it also had a lot of bad things about it. Although most of the areas, enemies and characters were recycled from the original, the magic really was not there, and they dialed the lame anime cheese up to 11. The writing was just flat out shit and generic in a lot of places, and I don't know what the fuck they were thinking in some other parts. It is actually a decent game to be fair, just not when compared to FF10, which is a shame. I've spent hundreds of hours playing Final Fantasy X through the years, and will probably spend many more hours in the future. It is a gem of timeless quality, with the greatest soundtrack of all time, one of the greatest stories, and one of the most striking art styles. It's a masterpiece. Thank you for watching. <laughs>